Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be here with you. Thank you, Pat, for your introductions, and I second Pat's thank you to the team. So, um, we are very blessed and fortunate to have Dr. Finley with us again. This is the third time he has done a retreat at St. Barnabas. Jim, is Jim on the screen, or is it me? It's me? So, um, I'm Jim too, by the way. So, um, thank you, Jim, for agreeing to be with us again. You're such a gift, and, and it is a great joy to have you. So, just briefly about Dr. Finley. He, he stayed at Gethsemane Monastery, where he was tutored or mentored by Thomas Merton. And then from that experience, Dr. Finley has written the classic book, Merton's Palace of Nowhere. Um, Pat referenced the latest book Dr. Finley has written, The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. And this, this will be published at the end of this month, and, and uh, our handouts tell you how to find it. It it's um, uh, purports to be a really interesting volume. It's all about Dr. Finley's experience of trauma in his early life. And then it goes beyond that to want to help us connect his story and his healing process with our own story and, and experience of trauma. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Dr. Finley is a member of the core faculty of the Center for Action and Contemplation with Richard Rohr. And so you can find some of his teaching and, and um, recordings and podcasts through the Center for Action and Contemplation. And he, he hosts a podcast titled Turning to the Mystics, which again, you can find through the Center for Action and Contemplation. So without much more, let me just say personally, it's been my experience to visit with Jim a few times and um, so much so that I'm comfortable calling him Jim and, and he's been a great gift to me as well as his teaching and his, his books. So without more, I, I turn to Dr. Finley, and I trust you'll be seeing him right away. There he is. All right. Great. Good. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, oh, I can't see any of you. I, oh, I see an empty pulpit. So... Uh, uh, if you can't hear me okay, I'm assuming you'll stop me, so someone will, and so I can, we can take care of the volume. Uh, first of all, I want to say how pleased I am that I was able to accept the invitation for us to be, to join you this morning for these reflections on the spirituality of healing. Um, uh, in these reflections, uh, I'm going to uh, begin by sharing my own story from the memoir. And uh, the memoir um, is an attempt to be to share in a very honest and vulnerable way about my own experiences of trauma and how in the trauma I experienced the presence of God uh, sustaining me in the trauma. And so what I'm really exploring here first within myself is the mysterious place where suffering and the presence of God touch each other or the mysterious place where in the suffering we, we, we can't experience God's presence. That sometimes when the suffering is so intense, it closes off experiential access to God's presence. It can get so intense we can't even find ourselves. But as, uh, as things settle and we get some breathing space, uh, we can sense something of the sustaining presence of God sustaining us uh, in the trauma. And I want to look at lessons to be learned in this journey. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to then move from, uh, from my experience to these lessons, and we're going to be moving on into how, after I left the monastery, uh, uh, what I learned from the men and women who shared their healing journey with me in almost 30 years uh, in psychotherapy and in contemplative spiritual direction. So I really want to move then 
I guess first this way for my story. And then I want to move to the insight that each of us is a unique addition of the universal story of being a human being. And this story is playing itself out in endlessly varied ways. Is my life, is your life, is the life of all who live with us on this earth. We're all woven together in the communal mystery of, of the human experience. And uh, moving from my life to our life, then touching you and your life. On wh wh where are you at in, in this process on the spiritual dimensions of healing, where the presence of God and suffering have touched uh, you and merged and blended in your own life? And where are you now with that? So it's really meant to be a kind of uh, Lexio Divina or a heartfelt meditation on the interior foundations of suffering and the interior foundations of the deep healing the spirituality brings into our life. And um, I, and, uh, I want to say, too, that uh, I'm, I'm doing this. One, you'll see this memoir. I never wrote like this before in such a personal way. And I'm supposed to be um, sharing the memoir and letting people know about it and sharing the story, which I'm doing. So not only have I not written like this before, but I've, I've never really uh, shared like this before in this specific way. So um, I'm finding my way. So this is, you're a guinea pig. This is the first time that I've done this. So it's in God's hands. We'll see how it goes. But I hope I don't get traumatized if I fall apart talking about the spirituality of trauma because I can't find my place in my own notes and we'll see what God has in mind. We'll just flow with it, see what happens. I'd like to begin with the reading, uh, the opening pages of the introduction. It's the only reading that I'll do in any substantive way, but I want to I want to give you a sense of the tone of it and then lead into the lessons learned. So I'll begin there. These reflections mark out a path, a way of life in which we as human beings may be healed from all that hinders us from experiencing the steady strong currents of divinity that flow on and on in the bittersweet alchemy of our lives. The surprising thing is that the intimate healing that spirituality brings into our lives is often hidden in the muck and the mire of the very things about ourselves we wish were not true. The secret opening through which we pass into wholeness is hidden in the center of those wounds we are most afraid to approach. The door that grants access to boundless fulfillment is hidden in the unfinished business of our lives. The places where we do not want to feel vulnerable, the things we tend not to sit with and listen to, the sometimes sad, sometimes tender, sometimes disarmingly simple, sometimes joyful things that make up the intimate substance of who we really are and are called to be. As I write this introduction, I'm immersed in these intimate depths, sitting next to my beloved wife Maureen as she lies here dying in the final stages of Alzheimer's. Even though she is unconscious and cannot open her eyes to look at me, I believe she can hear me as I speak from my heart in whispered words. Just now I told her that the ways of unbearable pain and crying that from time to time overtake me seem to soften at least a little as I learn to be more accepting of the immensity and the mystery of her death. After all, immensity and mystery have woven our years together from the very start. The slowness with which she is gently fading away from me seems continuous with the slow setting of the sun out over the ocean, which is just beyond this darkening room where Maureen and I have lived and shared so much over the past 30 years. I just told her that my suffering in trying to imagine life without her is eased in sensing that her soul is already beginning to pass over into God, leaving but a long vapor trail of herself in which she is still but barely tethered to her body. I just now shared with Maureen 
a memory that I have shared with her many times over our years together. The memory is about how deeply affected I was by something Thomas Merton said to me, us novices, not long after I entered the cloistered Trappist monastery of the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. Merton, who was master of novices, was speaking to us about an old lay brother who had just died. He encouraged us to realize that when we die, we don't go anywhere. We do not orbit the earth a few times and take off and go to God in some far-off celestial realm. For his scripture tells us, in God we live and move and have our being. All the angels, along with all the blessed who have crossed over into God, are here with us in the vast interiority of God, in whom we subsist as light subsists in flame. But we tend not to see the deathless mystery of God, nor do we tend to see the deathless mystery of ourselves subsisting in God breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. I think this is what Jesus meant in telling us that we have eyes to see but do not see. Finally, we tend not to see the deathless mystery of ourselves, of others, and of all things that alone is ultimately real, hence the fear and confusion in which we lose our way in this life. As I write these words, I know that the depths of presence and love they express is all-encompassing, vast, and true. But here is the painful, intimate thing, the density and intensity of the dread I feel, and not knowing how I'm going to be able to survive without Maureen, closes off my ability to experience the consoling truths these words embody. In moments like this, I've come to understand that God is a presence that protects us from nothing, even as we are inexplicably, unexplainably sustained in all things. I'd like to reflect on this. I guess one way of looking at this is I'm trying to find a way to move beyond the topic of suffering, to bear witness to the intimate immediacy of our suffering. And I'm trying to get beyond the topic of spirituality. I'm trying to bear witness to the intimate heart knowledge of God's presence uh, sustaining us and carrying us forward in each passing moment of our life. And I'm trying to find that mysterious place where these two realms and, and they uh, touch each other and merge with each other, the presence of God in the midst of our suffering. So that here, as with, Merton, with Maureen's death, that the suffering often is, when it's really intense, it closes off experiential access to the presence of God. As a matter of fact, it can get so at, intense, this is trauma, we, 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 we can't even find ourselves. We lose our way in our own life. But when there's some breathing space, often sometimes with the help of just one person who cares about us or is there for us, and we breathe into it, we can see something of the presence of God shining through the suffering, sustaining us in the suffering. And so uh, this is the territory I'm trying to explore here. It's, it's not easy to talk about. It's, it's, it, we can poetically explore it and uh, try to f find a way to renew our renewed awareness of it in our own life and so forth. And uh, so that's our intended agenda here, here, our purpose. Um, And so, uh, as, as she died, Maureen died two years ago, just th of three days ago was the anniversary of her death. And it's become uh, much more gentle with me now. I'm, I'm much more at home with it. And I, I very much feel her deathless presence here with me in this house where we live together all these years. And uh, just uh, the mystery of it all. And I realize I'm at a very mysterious place of my own journey as I'm about to approach my 80th birthday. Richard Rohr is going to come visit me in my home here tomorrow, so I look forward to that. We're both about the same age. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm beginning at the end, in a sense. And then I'm starting out 
at the end where I've arrived. This is this is where I'm at. I, I, another way that I would put it with me right now is that I'm not happy. I'm not happy because she's not here physically. I'm not happy. But I am amazed and I am at peace and I am grateful. And I trust the unfolding ways of God in my passage through time from birth to death. And uh, so now what I want to share then is uh, I want to go back to the beginning to my very earliest experiences as a small child on how I got here. And here I want to suggest to you a meditation practice if you're so inclined to do this at home, um, which is what I did here, too, is uh, to, to write a, a memoir, to write your memoir, and write it in, in the present tense at the feeling level. So it isn't just that you're going to remember something that happened in your early childhood, but you're going to go back and try to remember the way as a small child you experienced and how you understood what was happening to you. And reflect upon how that childlike experience, that, that, that experience, how uh, it is settled into you and can linger on within you and how over the years you've learned to try to grow into more mature understanding of the journey itself and looking back uh, at that unfolding process. And also to be very careful as you move towards a more uh, inclusive or more mature or more reality-based understanding of yourself, that you not you be careful not to close off experiential access to the mystery of childlike wonder. Jesus says, unless you accept the kingdom of God as a small child, you shall not enter it. Jesus said, be wise as a serpent and simple as a dove. To be wise as a serpent is to be street smart, is to walk your walk. As the years go by, hopefully, we grow into more inclusive, more understanding, more insight, more maturity, I guess. But being careful that we don't close off that, that childlike openness, uh, that mysterious uh, wonder, that disarming wonder like this, that it stays, not just stays alive, but it even deepens over time like this. Um, and so uh, I'll be sharing this, sto this story then of how I got here. And I'm going to start merging it then with uh, after I left the monastery and uh, 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 became a psychotherapist, spiritual director, how I uh, uh, was mo so moved by the stories of the men and women who shared their healing journey with me over the years, all the lessons that I learned. I'll be sharing some stories that I've heard on retreats and in their life. And, um, and so then this is, this is our theme then, if, that if each of us is a unique addition of the universal story of being a human being, so we're collectively in this together, and this leads to where, where are you at with this? Where are you at with this? And um, oh, what are the lessons then that you've learned along the way? And what, what are, what, where are you at with the unresolved matters of your own heart? And where are you with this? You know, sometimes another image I have here when I'm trying to, is that uh, sometimes you get the feeling in the, that in the momentum of the day's demands that we're uh, skimming over the surface of the depths of our own life. And we get the feeling that there's, there, there, that there's something missing, that we're, um, that we're, we're, like we're, we're suffering from death deprivation. And what's regrettable about it is that the depths over which we're skimming is the depth in which God's unexplainable oneness with us sustains us breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. So, so we're trying to come home by dropping down into and descending into a deeper intimate interiority with the unfolding mystery of our own life and the mysterious ways that uh, we have uh, become who we are sitting right now. 
Or here's another way of putting it as a meditation practice. How has it come to pass that you have come to be the man or woman who's even capable of being concerned about such things at the level at which you're capable of being concerned about such things? And is it not so that perhaps not that long ago it wasn't so true? That it wasn't so true that something's happening Something's happening and something trustworthy is unfolding within you as evidenced by the fact you were drawn to be here. You were drawn to be here that we might uh, walk more deeply with this story in which God walks with us unexplainably forever in the midst of our lives like this. I want to say another thing here about how we're speaking here and uh, what we're attempting to actualize. Um, when I was in the monastery, I, uh, Thomas Burton was novice master, and I had an opportunity to study a medieval philosophy under Daniel Walsh, who taught Thomas Burton philosophy at Columbia University. And he lived at the monastery and um, taught the monks medieval philosophy in the seminary program for the monks preparing for the priesthood. And I, I, I was deeply moved by that, by the metaphysics of Aquinas and Duns Scotus and Augustine, and it really enriched my life. So uh, after I left the monastery, um, uh, and started talking to people like this, the way I'm talking to you right now, on retreats in different settings. I asked Dan Walsh, I said, I wrote him a letter, and I said, uh, how can I communicate this to people out here? How can I communicate that we're the beloved, that we subsist in God like light subsist in flame? That when Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, the life he spoke of is the life that is at once God's and our own. How can I communicate that? And Dan Walsh wrote back to me. He said, you cannot communicate it, but it will communicate itself through you if you're convinced in what you say and if you are what you say. And you know it'll be communicating itself because there'll be a response in the listener. They'll, they'll know that deep calls unto deep, that the depths from which the words come into the speaker have the power to reach that same depth in the listener and each unto each you know that something that matters very, very, very much is being addressed. And it's something very intimate, and it's something that in some way you already know in some way. But you t we, we tend to forget it like this. And so uh, th this is the teaching, I think, this very heartfelt teaching that brings us home into these deep places uh, where we're so most seriously sustained by God in our mysterious journey from birth to death. And so with that, then I'd like to share some of my own story again, and then gravitating in this and in, in the second talk more to your story like this. Uh, so for me, so my own personal story, limiting myself to this point where the presence of God and suffering touch each other. This is my first memory. And it's often very helpful to think back, to be, become aware of your first memory, why your mind selects that out. Because very often that first memory holds a meaning that uh, sheds a light that, that you interpret in all the subsequent events of your life like this. So my first memory is I'm standing, I'm three years old, and I'm standing in, near the window in the living room of the house on Bruner Street in Akron, Ohio. And I see my father coming towards me. He has a slight smile on his face. I think he's coming towards me to pick me up. And instead he picked me up and he threw me across the room and my face at the side of a table leg. And I remember it felt hot and I fell to the floor crying. And I remember he stood over and straddled me and he walked away. That was my first memory. And so uh, I don't remember anything before that. And so my remembered life starts there. And trauma. My, I was the oldest of six children. My 
violent alcoholic father. I also witnessed many times him abusing my mother, abusing my siblings, abusing me. And this was my life. And my mother, who was a devout Roman Catholic, a lot of their arguments were about Catholicism and religion and so on. And she would take us to Mass on Sunday, and she would say at Mass, ask God to give us the strength to uh, be able to survive and hold on to the things that happen when Daddy gets mad. I remember that's how she put it. And one night I can remember another early memory I had was that uh, I was... Uh, uh, lying in bed at night, alone in the dark, and I could hear my father just outside the door screaming at my mother and hitting my mother. And I was scared, and I was very sad, because uh, maybe earlier that day he had hit me or yelled at me, and I knew that tomorrow he'd hit me again if he wanted to, and no one was going to stop it. And so I laid in the dark there, and I prayed the way frightened children pray. And my experience was, is that God heard my prayer, came to me in the dark and merged with me. That was the experience. Merged with me in a moment I could not remember. So that when I woke up in the morning, uh, the trauma still went on and on and on. It's going to get worse, actually. But it was much better for me. Because from that point on, when my father thought he was hitting me, he was hitting that other little boy that people can see. He didn't know the real me that only God can see was hidden safely away in a refuge deep inside of God, a place where my father knew nothing about. And uh, years later, when I became a clinical psychologist, uh, I learned that really what I was doing, I was dissociating, I dissociated. And I borrowed the religious imagery of my mother's Catholicism to give meaning to my dissociation. But the fact that that was true, that is true, and I stayed dissociated for many years. It was going to go on and on and on, actually. But that doesn't at all mean that God did not hear my prayer and God did not merge with me in the dark. And so here then is, is a lesson that to me is, I think it's important to all of us. I think very often it's true that we've internalized uh, distorted, uh, traumatizing beliefs about ourselves and feelings about ourselves, and that our understanding of God is often shaped in those distortions. That's true. That's often true. But that doesn't mean that God does not love us through and through and through and through, sustaining us unexplainably in the midst of our distortions. It does mean that it behooves us to move into more mature, more reality-based understandings of ourself, of life, and of how God is present in our life. That's certainly true. But the efficacy of the presence of God is not dependent on the, on the degree to which we come to that clarity. Because the, the love of God isn't depending on anything. It's of God infinitely choosing to give the infinity of herself away as who we simply are unexplainably forever. And so the whole idea, it seems to me, here, is that uh, uh, the, the piece of the, where God touches our lives like this, is that, is that we learn that to, our inner peace is not grounded in our ability to get past the confusion, or to get past the stuck place, or to get past ritualistic reenactments of the ways that we go around and around in circles sometimes. We do our best with that. We need to do our best. Rather, we need to put our faith in God, whose infinite love for us is in no way diminished by our confusion and our wayward ways. <clears throat> like that. Because this is... <coughs> because, <coughs> because the peace... This surpasses understanding is the peace of God that doesn't depend on our ability to get past anything. For it is a peace of God on which all things unexplainably depend. That sometimes we catch ourselves in the idolatry of, uh, of achieving and acquiring and progress over God being, over placing our faith in God being infinitely in love with us. In the, in, the, in the midst of our confusion, in the midst of our wayward ways, like this. And so, um, 
another image for me in my own life was um, uh, when I received my first communion, seven or seven years old, second grade Catholic. I don't know what the Episcopal tradition is on Eucharist with children, but the Catholic at least then was at seven, uh, seven years old. And I would go up with my mother to receive the Eucharist. And I believe that Jesus was in the Eucharist. And I would come back and put the kneeler down and I would kneel down and put my face in my hands and hold very, very still. And because of my, at seven years old, because I was inside the church, I was inside of God. And because I just received the Eucharist, I was inside of God who was inside of me. And with my eyes closed, I'd hold real, real, real still. And I sensed that I was in the gate of heaven. And for me, these experiences, these very childlike experiences, were the foundational to me. And they were more real to me than the all too painfully real trauma that was going on throughout the day at home. Uh, when I was in the seventh grade, my mother came to me and said that uh, after this, as children go up to bed and we were asleep, my father would stay up at night drunk and angry. And uh, she felt that sometimes his anger got so intense that uh, uh, she was afraid he might kill her. And she said, because I was the oldest, she wanted me to sit at the top of the stairs and listen. And if I felt he was actually starting to kill her, I was to run down the stairs out the front door and pound on a neighbor's door to yell for the police. So I sit at the top of the stairs listening to, and not knowing, is he just slapping her again? Is he just pulling her hair again? And what if he is starting to kill her? And I, I wait too long, am I responsible for her death? But what if I run down the stairs and he beats me to the front door? What if he kills me? And I sat like that. And after it calmed down one way or another, I just sat up there. I would go to my room, I'd close the door, I turn. I had a little vigil light. It was in a blue glass vigil light, and I would light the vigil light. It was for a statue of Mary. There was this icon there of Jesus, Bible there, and uh, I wrapped my rosary on my hands, and I would sit there in the dark, and I would bow over and touch my forehead to the floor the way devout Muslims pray, asking God to give me the strength, and I was given the strength unexplainably like this. And that was what my life was like. That's what my life was like. And um, uh, when I was in the ninth grade, I was attending an all boys Catholic school uh, taught by the Holy Cross Brothers at Notre Dame. And uh, the trauma had gotten worse at this point, the violence and so on. And he mentioned monasteries. And I'd never heard of monasteries before. And he said, they're places where people go to live in silence, seeking God for the salvation of the world. And he talked about Thomas Merton. And uh, he mentioned that Thomas Merton wrote a book, The Seven Story Mountain. It was on the New York Times bestsellers list. And as a young man, he left Columbia University graduate studies and entered the monastery where he lived as a cloistered monk and wrote these books of God that moved so many, many people. So that day after school, I went up to the school library and there was one book by Thomas Merton there on the shelf. And it was a sign of Jonas, which is a journal that Thomas Merton kept in the monastery. And when I opened it on the opening page of the journal, uh, Merton wrote, he said, as for me, I have but one desire, the desire for solitude, to be lost in the secret of God's face. And uh, at 14 years old, I didn't know what that meant, but something in me did and said, me too. And in that moment, it was given to me that I knew more than I knew that I knew. I, I wanted to be lost in the secret of God's face. And uh, I got my own copy of the sign of Jonas. And through the four years of high school, as the violence went on and on and on, I would sit absorbed in, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, in, in the journals of Thomas Merton, because of the, he, I could tell he was speaking from such a deep and beautiful place that it wasn't hearsay. It wasn't hearsay. And, uh, and he, he spoke with such a vulnerability. Uh, I think if he would have talked like some lofty person that had everything 
figure it out, and he was speaking from on high. It wouldn't have touched me so. But he was so, in the journals, he was so honest about his own struggles that it accessed me and it spoke to me. And um, I uh, began to then to feel that I was being called to enter the monastery. And so when I graduated from high school, I, um, uh, my father didn't go to my graduation. He was drunk, he didn't go. And he didn't know anything about my desire to enter the monastery. I was writing to the monastery. I had the letter sent to my grandmother's house so he wouldn't see the mail. And uh, he was out trimming the hedges. And I told him I wanted to go be a monk. He said he, he, wasn't, he, said he'd never heard of such a thing. What is that? So I explained it to him as best I could. I wanted to go live a life of prayer and seek God and so on. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, if you go to that place, he said, I'll kill your mother to punish you. He said, that's not a threat. He said, that's a promise. I'll kill her. And I just walked away. And uh, I was used to that. And uh, uh, that night I got up in the middle of the night. I left a note on my bed. I took my high school book bag with a change of underwear, a rosary, and a missile for mass, and a change of socks or something. <laughs> and uh, got up uh, and walked in the dark to uh, uh, St. Bernard's Church where I went to mass, walked across the street to the Greyhound bus station, and uh, went to the monastery, which radicalized me in God. And uh, uh, the monastery, uh, monastery, and this is a cloistered Trappist monastery, so in the Catholic Church, there are most, most orders, like the Benedictines and the Jesuits and the Franciscans, they have like an active ministry. It's the vowed life, a consecrated life with a ministry. But the cloistered contemplative orders, there's no outward ministry. They, they, don't, uh, they don't serve the poor. They don't work in parishes. They never leave. And as cloistered, no one comes in. It's the anonymity of God. And it's this hidden life of a God-seeking life believing that in fidelity to the hidden life, that it touches the whole world in ways we don't understand. And I, I felt called to, to, that, to that life. And so for six years, I got up at 2.30 in the morning uh, for chanting vigils. We chanted the psalm seven times, the canonical hours throughout the day. Uh, it was a life of silence. We didn't talk to one another, we used sign language. And you weren't supposed to make useless signs, it was considered frivolous to make useless signs. And so for the six years that I lived there, I don't, I don't know how many monks were there then, a lot more than now, maybe 200 monks. I never once spoke in a dialogical way with any of the men that I lived with for the six years. And uh, the, in this communal silence, this God-seeking silence, and chanting the Psalms, slept on a straw mattress on boards in a common unheated dormitory. And uh, the, my life and uh, uh, when I went in to see Thomas Merton, I was right out of high school, and when I went in to see Thomas Merton, I was so moved by it that this person who wrote this book that so accessed me and brought me to the monastery, that I was going to be able to sit with him face to face so he would guide me to God. But because of my trauma, I had issues with authority figures. So when I, And I wanted him to think well of me. I wanted him to guide me. And in my trauma, uh, I was so nervous, my voice was shaking, like I was having a hard time getting my breath. And uh, he said, what's happening? And with my voice shaking, I said, I'm scared because you're Thomas Merton, I said. And I was so embarrassed because I didn't want him to see the way inside I knew myself to be. And I tried to hide it from myself and everybody because I was ashamed of it, the sphere that I carried. And then he said something to me that just was one of these moments that changed my life, really. You know, one of the signs of authentic depth in God is it heightens our empathy with the suffering of others. Where it, where it doesn't lessen sensitivity to the suffering of others, but it heightens the sensitivity. You know how sometimes if you've ever had a friend or someone who's really suffering and they're just hurting, they're just beside themselves, 
and you say something that helps, and you don't know how you knew to say that. Like there's this grace givenness like this. And uh, as a mystical, mystically awakened teacher, I was sitting in the presence of this person. I saw him as some towering figure, like way beyond anything that I could ever hope to attain. And what he said to me was, I worked at the pig barn at the time. They have a big farm operation. He said, every day under obedience, I, I want you to end afternoon work early before Vespers, clean up and come in here and knock on the door and tell me one thing that happened to the pig barn that day. And inside, I remember the voice said inside, I can do that. And uh, I would go to knock on the door and he'd be typing on one of his books. I could hear the typewriter going. He'd push the typewriter aside and we would sit there and I would tell him something and he would listen. He tracked with all of it and how's sound number five doing and all of it. And it leveled the playing field for me, just completely leveled it. And of all the things that I've studied about Merton's writings and all that I've taught on Merton, I don't know if anything went as deep as what happened when it leveled the playing field in uh, being one with me in my brokenness. I was so moved by that for me. And uh, he, he uh, led me to uh, the teachings of the mystics and to the radical awakenings that I was going to have there like this. And so uh, I want to share two graces here that change my life radically. <clears throat> One was that um, uh, I got permission from Merton to spend some time each day in the hayloft of an abandoned sheep barn. It was across the flatlands there. And um, I, would, I, I was up in the loft of this barn, and the, the loft doors were always open. Part of it looked up over the woods. His hermitage was right up through the woods. But off to the side was this meadow. And uh, <clears throat> I would read the Psalms and just be there. I remember it was very hot. And I was walking back and forth, <coughs> reading the Psalms. <coughs> and all of a sudden, it became unexplainably clear to me <coughs> that what we tend to think of the air is God. And that I was walking back and forth in God, breathing God. <coughs> and the... <coughs> And this atmospheric God that I was breathing was all-encompassing. So if I would try to run away from God, no matter where I would run to, God would be waiting for me when I got there. And there was no need to run because God knew me through and through and through and through and through as tender-hearted mercy like this. And I was so moved. There was no emotions. There was no visions or but it was as tangible as the of this it was it was so so real to me and i spent the two more hours sitting on a bale of hay looking out over the meadow like this just breathing god like this and uh it was just and then on sundays um uh, we were allowed to walk uh in the woods on the other side of this little country road that went to the vast property of the monastery and uh, some months later, it, it really it doesn't. It's, it's cold in Kentucky. It doesn't snow a lot, like uh, it did when I was in Ohio. I'm in California now, but uh, it snowed. And on on a, uh, a Sunday afternoon, we were allowed to have a long interval where you could take walks. And uh, I walked up through the woods in the snow, and I sat at the base of the tree in the snow. And I put my head back against the tree and I looked up to the bare branches and the snow coming down to the bare branches. And it was so quiet. You could hear that quiet hiss sound the snow makes when it hits the snow like this. And as I was looking up to the bare branches like this, a full grown deer came by. Well, but I was upwind, uh, downwind from the deer and I was sitting so still the deer didn't see me. It was just maybe like 20 feet away from me, full grown deer. I put a head full of antlers, eyes full of God. And it turned and looked at me, but I was so still was I that it didn't see me. 
and it walked on through the woods like that. And my heart was pounding because I knew if I scared it, it could hurt me. And it walked off into the woods. And I looked up to the bare branches of the trees like this. And uh, in a silent prayer, I said to God, I said, Lord, is this the way it is with us? That as I look up to these bare branches with the snow falling from unclean, unseen places in a slate gray sky, that I'm looking right at you and I don't see you. And if I don't see you, then I don't see me because I don't see that I and the snow and the trees and the deer, we are your manifested presence. And I just sat like that. There were a lot of moments like that for me there. Changed my whole life, I can't tell you, really. And Merton introduced me to the, to the, uh, to the, to the Christian mystics, to St. John of the Cross. And uh, I can remember the very first time that I, uh, well, I never read John of the Cross before, 16th century Spanish mystic. And uh, I walked out into the woods. I sat at the base of a tree and I, I opened and I read the first opening pages of St. John of the Cross like this. And uh, John of the Cross's voice was the same as Merton's voice. That is Merton's voice was the was the mystical lineage of Christian consciousness. And uh, I, I didn't understand a lot of what John of the Cross was saying. It went over my head, but it was more like hitting me in the chest and the stomach like music. Like a, it was just so intimate and so heartfelt to me like this. And so it was <clears throat> moments like this that I, um, I, don't, I don't know, I just, <clears throat> I just thought I was home free. Really, I was going to spend my life there and, and so on. And uh, I'll end on this note. We'll pick up next time. And then what happened is that um, I was sexually abused by one of the monks, a priest, my confessor, and uh, who Merton thought very highly of. Everyone thought so highly of this person. And uh, I had a breakdown. I had a breakdown. I became extremely dissociative and paranoid. And... and um, I felt that, uh, you know, I worked at the, it was in the winter time and there was a, a sow herd, there was a boar that ran with the sow herd in the woods and my job was to go out and check on the sow herd and I was, I was responsible for this thing and, and um, the boar walked out on the ice and fell through the th ice of this little lake there in the woods and drowned. And uh, I felt as I was walking around, I felt I was unraveling and that sanity was like thin ice over icy cold black water and it was cracking. And if I fell through because of my trauma history, I might never find my way back again. And so I left. I didn't tell the abbot what happened. I didn't tell Thomas Burton what happened. I didn't tell John Hughes, who was a psychiatrist. I didn't, I just left. And uh, so here's, here's, here's the lesson. is uh, see how can we learn to be healed from all that hinders us from experiencing the steady strong currents of divinity that flow on and on in the bittersweet alchemy of our lives. The alchemy is just not how phases of happiness can unexpectedly become precipitously sad or frightening, nor is it how something so sad can suddenly break wide open with liberation like an unexpected gift or a love or a presence or a child or something. It isn't just the rhythm of darkness and light and birth and death, the rhythms of your life, the rhythms of my life. Like this. Rather, see the alchemy, the alchemist of old, we're trying to turn lead into gold. And lead into gold is how do we turn the, un, the unrelenting, unforeseeableness of life how can we learn to experience the, the, bit, the, 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 the steady, strong currents of divinity that flow on and on and on so unexplainably that it brought me and brought all of you up to this very moment that I'm talking right now, like this. How has this come to pass like this? See? And how, how can I learn to find my way to this groundedness?
that's always there. And finding my way to it, how can I abide in it? And how can I learn to share it with others? So I'd like to end with this story. Um, the story was told to me by uh, each, each of these chapters in the book ends with a story and a prayer. So I'll share with you this story. This story was told to me by Mary, Mother Luke Tobin, and she was Mother Superior of uh, Sisters of Loretto in Denver. And she and Thomas Murn were very close friends. He had a deep respect for her. And uh, the story is this, is that, you know, in the early church, uh, men and women went out into the desert for this interior martyrdom uh, to be transformed by God into God in solitude. And um, there's a story then of this hermit who heard a knock at his door. And when he opened it, it was a mother and a father with their little girl. And the parents said to the hermit, they apologized for intruding on his solitude. But they said, as you can plainly see, an evil wizard has turned our daughter into a donkey. And we would like you to pray over her so we can have our daughter back. The hermit said, I see, come in, come in, come in. And he had him sit off to the side. And he asked the little girl if she was hungry and would like something to eat. She said she would like that. And so he was talking to her while he prepared a meal for both of them. And they sat down and he asked her about herself about things about her life and so on. And as the parents were watching how lovingly he spoke to the little girl and how attentive he was to her, they suddenly realized the evil wizard did not cast a spell on their daughter, turning their daughter into a donkey. The evil wizard cast a spell on them to believe that their daughter was a donkey. And so when they left, uh, they were so relieved and grateful to have their daughter back. And the little girl was so relieved because it's very hard to be a little girl when your parents think you're a donkey, especially if because you're a child and to avoid the confusion, you start believing it yourself. There's like a shame-based, traumatized place within yourself that you, you don't know what to do about it like this. So... And by saying then that the deep healing that that little girl and her parents experienced in this story bears witness to the deep healing that I hope that we are exploring together in these pages. I'm going to say that we're exploring together here today. It's not, a, notice Jesus, Jesus gave sermons and told parables. He didn't give lectures. It's not content. It's not a method. It's not a strategy. It's not like that. Thomas Burton once said in the monastery, he said, to, I'll paraphrase it. <clears throat> he says, imagine you tell God, you know, Lord, this mystical union with you, uh, I, I want it more than anything, anything. Help me to be mystically united with you under one condition, under one condition, that when I cross the line and over into mystical union, that my ego will remain intact. And I'll become a mystical ego and finally get the respect I deserve. And Merton told me, God's not handing out any special deals in this operation like this. See, we're always trying to hold on to something. St. John of the Cross says, a bird held by a slender thread is held must of prisoners, one held by a great rope, if it will not break that thread. And uh, we're afraid to break the thread that tethers us to all that's infinitely less than God. The ritualistic reenactment of our fears, our shame-based stories about ourself, it goes on and on and on. But then you get the delightful realization that even though you don't break the thread, it's already dissolving and being unraveled by God's infinite mercy for you, loving you through and through and through in the midst of your wayward ways and all that is unresolved within your heart. This is the true life. This is the good news. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. May your reading of these reflections, may, your, may our listening together to these words in a sincere and heartfelt manner help you to find your way yet further along the healing path on which you have already embarked. As you continue on this way, I hope that you will continue to discover in all sorts of unexpected ways that you are becoming a healing presence in an all-too-often traumatized and traumatizing world. 
By that I mean you will continue to be graced with realizations that you are becoming someone in whose presence others are better able to experience the gift and the miracle of who they really are deep down and who they're called to be so that they in turn can pass on the contagious energy of healing to others. Amen. So be it. So. So uh, we now have 15 minutes for a dialogue. And here's, here's the idea. Those of you who have any questions, uh, if you begin filing out now and lining up at the microphone, so you're already lined up because it's only 15 minutes. And so if we have to wait for each person to start from there to come up, so it, there might not be any questions or concerns or comments, whatever, like, because this language, this, what I'm opening up here, this is very evocative. You know, it just raises deep things in all of it. What about this and what about that and so on. So if there are any questions, you can come forward now. And also, if you would please just limit yourself to one question. And so this is kind of symbolic. We don't have nearly enough time to have an ongoing dialogue here, but a symbolic but real kind of dialogue here with each other. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to come forward. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I so appreciate what you're sharing with us. I just don't understand why a loving God allows suffering. I see God's presence in it and how God uses it to heal us and be with us. But why does it exist? Is it necessary to connect with God and know grace and be humbled and open to receive the yeah, depth yeah. of God? But why? Yeah. Yes. This is my sense of it. Yes, this is my sense of it. I guess. Um, we don't know why we don't. Uh, we do know that whatever it means that God takes care of us, it doesn't mean that God takes care of us in stopping the unfair, the cruel, uh, the brutal things from happening. This is the mystery of the cross. This is the mystery of the cross, really. It kind of the, epitomizes this great mystery. Like this, the mystery of love crucified. What is it, what is the view from the cross? Like, what's the world look like? So we we don't know. We, we here we are. We do have the sense that we're in a fallen state. Fallen uh, uh, original sin, not like there's some blight on the soul, but rather that you know the word trauma means a wound or a source of suffering is a trauma. And as human beings are subject to traumas great and small. But the deep trauma is a traumatized capacity to habitually abide in the infinite love that's welling it up and giving itself to us breath by breath. And because we're exiled from that love, we act out the traumatizing things we do to ourselves and to each other. It's life on this earth. So we don't know why, but we do know the response to it. And the response to the suffering is love. We don't know why, but we know the response. And what I hope to convey in this talk, you have your suffering, I have mine. But intermingled, the alchemy, mingled with the suffering are the blessings. Because if it wasn't for the blessings, I wouldn't talk like this. And if it wasn't for the blessings in you, you wouldn't be moved to be sitting there listening to this. And so we're together on this earth. See this beautiful, eloquent, brutal, unfair, violent world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son and he walks with us unexplainably. And so we take it to our heart in prayer and then we walk with that and try to share that with others as best we can. Thank you. You're welcome. It is a mystery. It is, it is a deep mystery. Yes. It is a mystery. Hello. Hi. My question 
relates to the way you've experienced God through the branches and the snow and the deer in relation to your academic learning. And I'd like to know at what point in your trauma did you access the clinical psychiatrist, psychologist learning through your doctorate and how that met with your experiences of God and how it helped you in your way. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll be talking about that in the second talk, but I'll respond briefly now, okay. just so you know. By the way, this is a frustrating thing. Like, uh, by the way, this whole, all this I said today, I mean, right now, is about a, a nine pages of the book. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just, well, I mean, what's the mother to do? You know what I mean? I'm trying to pass on something here. And the answer is, that, uh, let me read the whole book and I'll talk real fast. <laughs> we would trade our subject matter. So there's like soundings from the heart, but I'll answer briefly. Uh, when, I, when I left the monastery, I became a high school religion teacher, got married, first woman I ever dated. It was a very dysfunctional marriage of two children. So it, I, I recreated my childhood to just chaotic kind of stuff. And in that chaos, I wrote Merton's Palace of Nowhere. Uh, it took five years to write it on how to find our ultimate identity in God. And when that book came out, uh, I got invitation to lead silent retreats like this, talks like this. And uh, one of the very first invitations I received was from a clinical psychologist. And I, I finished the retreat on Thomas Merton. And the psychologist said, if you'd be willing to commit yourself to the contribution the mystical traditions make to mental health. I'll see to it that you can have a PhD in clinical psychology with family support as a gift, not a loan, just a gift. I was a high school teacher. And uh, so my wife and two young children moved from Cleveland, Ohio to Pasadena, California for five years of full-time doctoral work in clinical psychology. And uh, I was still giving the re every other weekend, I was giving retreats somewhere in the country and then got into a place where every other weekend I'd led a silent retreat, then Monday through Thursday I sat with trauma survivors and I went back and forth. So what I learned as a contemplative clinician, as a clinician, I was trained to be a clinician, to assess, diagnose, and treat psychological symptoms and embody suffering, to be, a, to be a, a clinical, but as a contemplative clinician, I was looking for openings for the depth dimensions of the preciousness of themselves shining out through their tears. And based on where they were, just because I had to join them in their language for this. And uh, uh, I often found that, uh, often it happens in therapy, it's, it's a lot actually, that the people would have these awakenings. It isn't that they would leave therapy less symptom free, one would hope so, but they would come away knowing that they were granted something. And unexplained, like they would say to me sometimes things like, I matter. I didn't believe that I mattered, that my life counts in some explainable way. And I found something deep within me that no one can ever take from me, like this. And for Carl Jung, this is where psychotherapy touches spirituality, I think. And uh, so on the, oh, Richard Rohr's website, I have about five hours of my talks on that from a clinical point of view. But now we're talking from this point of view. So I would answer it that way. Thank you. No. No. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Kathy. Hi. Hi, Hi Kathy. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm really struck by two things you said, particularly one was the deer seeing you but not recognizing you and this issue of so, I mean, constantly seeing God and not recognizing God um, with wonderful breakthrough moments. And the other is that probably 30 years ago, I picked up a greeting card and it said, um, it was an Ojibwe <clears throat> saying, I think, sometimes I go about pitying myself and all the time I'm getting carried, by, carried through the sky by great winds. Yeah, I, I did love not, that quote. I didn't understand it at all. It was completely unfathomable, and I have kept that card. 
and now I understand it. So yeah. something has changed. <laughs> yeah. That's so very good. the other thing is this issue that with all of our efforts and my efforts to <clears throat> advance myself on the spiritual journey, are you kind of saying they they don't matter all that much because God is doing the work of dissolving that tie anyway? And in that case, should we just be surrendering to that? Uh, that would be maybe the, yeah. the fundamental practice. Um, anyway, I wanted yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Several thoughts. Very good. I have several thoughts. One, living, walking this walk and living this way is to know that the things that happen to us do not have the authority to name who we are. They don't, because only love has the authority to name who we are. So we're grounded in a love that utterly transcends, yet utterly permeates, and is wholly mysteriously present in the things that happen to us. But not to fall into the idolatry of conditioned states of consciousness, conditioned by conditions, but to live by this inner light in the midst of conditions. And the second thing is this, that we don't live in that light as a way to kind of uh, glide over the messy details but to give us the wisdom to walk through the messy details mm -hmm. in a vulnerable, honest, caring, and heartfelt way, like sifting it out, sifting it out, <clears throat> sifting it out. And so that the wisdom uh, over time starts coming to uh, the sense of a kind of, a, uh, the way I put it, it's incarnate infinity intimately realized. That somehow there's like an incarnate divinity woven through the very details of, of standing up and sitting down, of laughing and crying, of my life and your life, see, riven through all of it as a mystery, and empowering us to be present to it, see, and uh, in a grounded, loving, uh, wobbly way. You know, uh, we, that's my sense of it. So like you said in the beginning, to bear witness to it all, knowing yeah, that yeah. it's all in love. Yeah, yes, and also that we're a work in progress. Yeah. You know, you're at the crest of the wave of, there's unresolved matters in my life, just trying to get through another day here. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I was so worried this morning about these talks are gonna not go well, and I never did this before, and you know, this could be my Waterloo right here, it could all be over, and I just <laughs> make the sign of the cross and go for it. And, uh, cause I, I, cause I, I, and the reason I do that, as I keep forgetting, when I do that, I think I'm the one who has to give the talk, so I worry. But if I just surrender and let the voice speak through me, it flows. And uh, I, I learned that over and over again. I can't understand it. It's so strange in a way. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, from your uh, experience with the work of the Cloud of Unknowing, um, do you have a, a sense for um, the value of the cloud of forgetting and the, uh, the, um, the, the possibility that God gives us a choice to suffer or not? Well, I, I think this, yes, the cloud of unknowing, the cloud of forgetting. You know, Thomas Merton says at the end of New Seeds of Contemplation to, uh, to, to uh, cast our awful solemnity to the winds. And it's like uh, to forget the self that keeps forgetting, meaning not to be identified with it anymore. So the cloud of forgetting isn't that we forget. The cloud of forgetting is the grace of not attributing authority to internalize experiences through time, to name who we are. See, it's not, it's, it's, it's not the, it's, uh, uh, the idolatry, because that's, notice in the beginning of the Cloud of Unknowing, this is what he said. He said, there are some of those presently living the act of life, that, which is a life through effort, through grace, effort, discipleship, see, efficacious unto holiness. They're presently gaining the act of life, or being prepared by God to grasp the message of this book. I am thinking of those who feel the mysterious action of the Spirit stirring in their inmost being, stirring them to love. And so you're quickened. 
with a moment of a oneness beyond circumstances in the midst of circumstances. And having tasted it, you realize you're being called to abide in it. And the whole book is centering prayers. That's the contemplative depth of our path. You know? We'll talk about that more in the second talk also. Let's do one more, one last one. Yes. Hi, um, I uh, so I, I think I have a, a quick a quick question, but I um, suffered from long COVID and ultimately had a series of ketamine treatments that had a huge healing effect, both physically and mentally. And my question is, can something like that? Um, do you believe that it can affect your ability to connect spiritually? Yes, it can. It can. It, because, see, I, so I said about trauma too, psychological trauma, physical trauma. Trauma is a risky business, whether it be psychological trauma, like major depression or suicidality or anxiety with panic attacks, one process internalized trauma. And uh, it's risky because it can do you in. Do I mean it can, it can uh, kind of threaten the capacity to live in the quality of your own life? That's why we're, it always behooves us to uh, seek and undergo healing as best we can and so on. But sometimes, uh, even though the suffering really is so, like a physical illness, for example, we're psych struggling with psychological symptoms, e even though uh, uh, it's a struggle, it, unexpectedly, it can bring about an unexpected illumination. Here, here's how I put it, that sometimes you can feel lost in the dark. And when you're lost in the dark, if you don't panic, you discover you're not alone in there. That there's an unseen light that your eyes can't see who came in looking for you, who really was there all along, and is mysteriously leading you out of the darkness into the light. And when you come out of the light into a better place, you're so grateful, but you also know it's important to bring out with you into the light what you learned in the darkness, not to be presumptuous about God's presence and fragility and brokenness, because then it's empathy with all of humanity that's broken and lost and can't find their way out. And so it, it can be a turning point, it can be a, a spiritual awakening that has had one's life in a whole deeper way yeah, I think so. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll have a short sit. I won't say to the schedule. So it'll just be a few minutes, maybe five minutes sit. <clears throat> and so uh, I invite you to sit straight and uh, fold your hands in prayer and bow. I'll ring the bell once. We'll do the sit. And then I'll, I'll ring the bell uh, at the end. And then we'll bow again. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, we have to 11.50, okay, good, we'll continue, we'll continue. <clears throat> what I thought I'd do here, and again, I'm, I'm finding my way here, I'm, I'm gonna do a series of things like this with this book, so, uh, uh, I'm finding my way. So, one, I, I, I think I'll keep the way that I did the first conference, I think that works, I think, stay with that, I think that conveys something, and carries it over. What I want to do in the second uh, conference is I want to share a series of stories that I share throughout the book that are kind of like parables or stories of awakening and there ought a lesson from each of each story, of each event, insights. Uh, <clears throat> first is a, a, a poetic image of awakening, uh, kind of writ large, like poetically, like the magnitude of it all. And then I want to talk about how simple it is and calibrating our heart to a very fine scale to pick up on this. Because the, the thing is that the, 
the essential never imposes itself. The unessential is constantly imposing itself. But by a higher order wisdom of the awakened heart, see, we can choose to be faithful to the ever so delicate, ever so subtle uh, uh, flow of this grace, love. Merton says that beating in our very blood, whether we want it to or not, and learn to stabilize in it throughout the day. So I'd like to share first a, a poetic image of the <clears throat> magnitude of it. Is one way I experience it. <clears throat> Imagine you're you're sitting in a room all alone, and uh, there's no furniture in the room except for the one chair in the middle of the room that you're sitting in. You're facing one of the walls. Uh, there are no windows, and the the ceiling is all white. The walls are all white. The carpeting is all white. You're sitting in this chair. Nothing else is in the room. It's lit up, and you're sitting there. And imagine that as you sit there, there's an unseen dimmer switch somewhere, and the uh, uh, the your room gets darker and darker and darker. And on the other side of the wall that you're facing, there's a light getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And here it's not a solid wall that you imagine, but it's a kind of a veil, kind of a tightly stretched thin veil. And as your room gets darker and the light on the other side gets brighter, uh, you can see through the veil. And right on the other side of the veil is God. And the saints and the angels are there. And they're, they can see that you can see them. They're laughing. They're waving at you. And you smile and you wave back like you can't believe it. And then they kind of all pass through the veil. And they surround you in your chair. Like they, they encircle you in kind of a rapturous kind of unbelievable moment. And then they pick you up and carry you through the veil, through the veil to be with them on the other side of the veil. Then they carry you back and join you on your side of the veil. Then they carry, that goes on over and over, back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. And uh, then you're sitting there and little by little by little, the light on the other side of the room gets dimmer, dimmer, dimmer. And your light in your room gets brighter, brighter, brighter. And you're sitting there all alone like this. And, uh, uh, you're just looking at the wall. And, and it is a wall. You go up and you touch it with your hand. You can't walk through it. It's a solid wall. But here's the thing. You know that at one level, to your physical eyes, your ego self, it is a wall. But at a much deeper level, you know there's no wall. Because you experienced it. See? Thomas Merton once said, when we have a unit of awakening in our life, they come in all kinds of ways. He said, there are certain things in life you simply have to accept as true. You go crazy inside. And they're the very things uh, you can't explain to anybody, including yourself. And so uh, there are moments of awakening, like quickening. And uh, you, say, you say to your heart, like a promise in your heart, I will not break faith with my awakened heart. And my most childlike hour the hour of birth, the hour of love, the hour of death, the hour of sorrow, the, the, the quiet hour at day's end, whatever. I, I glimpsed God's oneness with me through and through and through and through. And uh, having glimpsed the oneness, I know that my life will be forever incomplete without it. And I know that in this moment that I was, that I glimpsed the oneness, this, this heightened presence, this oneness, it isn't as if something more was given, but a curtain parted, and I fleetingly glimpsed what every moment's always like. And uh, so I will not break faith with my awakened heart. I will not play the cynic. And uh, uh, I, uh, and I think uh, the, the next point I'd like to make is this. It isn't as if awakenings aren't rapturous like I just described. Sometimes very intense things happen to us. For changes, sometimes there are certain moments in the uh, of awakening and the aftermath. You're never the same the rest of your life. Sometimes, when quite young, we're granted an awakening. We spend the rest of our life being faithful to. It's, it's really true, but almost always these awakenings are very delicate, like very extremely subtle. That, like, if you weren't careful, you would have missed it. And I'd like to give some examples of this. Thomas Merton says at the end of uh, New Seas of Contemplation, he says, um, uh, he says, the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. 
The silence of the spheres is the music of a wedding feast. And here he's bearing witness to the contemplative understanding of reality, to mystical Christianity. That, that ultimately just one thing is happening. The infinite presence of God is infinitely presencing herself, pouring herself out, giving herself away in and as the gift and the miracle of the intimate immediacy of my very presence, the presence of others and the presence of all things in our eternal nothingness without God. It's not saying that we're God. Quite the opposite. It's, if God would cease loving us into the present moment at the count of three, uh, we'd all disappear because we're nothing, absolutely nothing, apart from the love of God being poured out as the mystery of our very presence and our nothingness without God. If God would cease loving the universe into existence at the count of three, the whole universe would vanish. We're not used to thinking of things like this. See, the, the God-given godly nature of every breath and heartbeat. And uh, the, 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 the moment, he says, as a kind of a dance, the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. And then he says, at the end of that same passage, he says, we do not have to go very far to catch echoes of that game and of that dancing. And he starts giving a list of little moments. At first, he says, uh, we're out walking alone in the midst of nature. And he said, we turn to see a flock of birds descending. And how I put it, you're out walking alone, you turn, you see the birds descending, and as if out of the corner of your eye, you catch something in their descent that's primordial, vast, and true. And you know that in the presence of the birds, you're in the presence of God, unexplainably. And we sit there for a while, grateful. Subtle, 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 subtle. Or, or you may give yourself over to the smell of a blood red rose. Or you might lie awake at the night, in the dark at night listening to your breathing. He says it can also come in the midst of love. There's sometimes a moment between two people deeply in love with each other. They give themselves over in love and they say to each other in the loving moment, uh, we are one. And in the love they know that they are one. But in being that they're one, they don't cease to be two. Because if they would cease to be two, um, they wouldn't be there to know that they're one. But they don't live by the two-ness, they live by the oneness. And this all-pervasive oneness of love that permeates the two-ness, permeates everything. It, it's, it's like a flame that flickers in the wind. They have to work at it because it can all slip away. It can all slip away like this. Imagine a husband and wife sitting there together in a moment, weekly moment that every married couple has many times, they're going through the weekly chores of what they do for the week. Get the car fixed, dental appointment, uh, fix the back gate, whatever. And at the end of the uh, time there, she says, I don't know if this is a good time or not, but I had a thought last night about us. He said, no, no, what, no, what is it? And she says, you know, before we met, Actually, I, I, I didn't know love like this existed. And he said, me either. And uh, she says, uh, the thing about it is, she says, it's, it's gotten so deep. He said, yeah, he says, it has. And she said, I suppose if we keep going this way, it'll get deeper. He says, he said, I suppose it will. And she pauses and says, I wonder if we'll ever get to a depth of love so deep, there'll be no deeper depth of love to get to. See, See what she's really asking, is there an end to love? And asking the question, her already knows the answer. They'll never get to an end of love because it has no end. And, if the, if, and, and also notice this, when they're going down the chores like this, and she says, I had a thing about us. Is this okay? It isn't just the, the relationship. It isn't like we get the car fixed and have the dental appointment, and then there's us. She's shifting into a qualitatively different kind of subject that calls for a qualitative shift in consciousness. It's not objectifiable. It's not in the realm of the problematic. It, it's the intimately givenness of themselves. And in that moment, they realize ever so subtly that there is no end. They're like moment. They're like a momentary mystic together, 
and they know that in their love for each other that God's the infinity of their love for each other and their love of the incarnate immediacy of love. It can wash over you while you're reading a child a good night story and how disarming they are like this. And it just washes over and it grants itself to you. Then in the presence of this child, I'm in the presence of God. I haven't wanted to share a story, true story. Uh, I, uh, uh, I need to close the door because I'll be distracted. My, on weekends, my daughters take turns coming to the house and helping me. We have lunch together. And my daughter might be coming in to do chores. And I, I, I don't, it's distracting me. So excuse me, just a minute. This is the contemplative life in the real world. Okay, just a moment. I can't have anything, uh, anyway, I have to stay, uh, I, I, anyway, I don't want to have something compromise, the flow of this for me. Um, I was once, years ago, I was flying somewhere to give a, a retreat, <clears throat> and I was in an aisle seat, and I had my, it was Meister Eckhart or something, I had my book open, a fountain pen, I was taking the notes for my talk, talks like this, and sitting in the middle seat was a woman reading a magazine. And in the window seat was her child. He was a boy, maybe four years old, like this, I don't know, like this. And he was looking out the window. And we were flying along like this. And the little boy said to his mother, without turning around, he said over his shoulder, he said, Mommy, uh, does the man driving the plane know where Grandma lives? That was, he's taking this in, like, uh, and she said, without looking up from her magazine, <clears throat> she said, close enough. And I thought to myself, that's a very clever answer. Because if grandma lives in the greater Chicago area, Chicago Air airport's close enough. But the child was too little to appreciate the cleverness of her answer. The child just accepted it and kept looking out the window. And then, and this is what I mean by the subtlety of these moments, like the delicacy of the John of the Cross talks about being held a prisoner by a hair that flutters on the neck of the beloved, like the littlest of things like this. Uh, she, she turned and looked at the back of her child's head. She closed her magazine. She leaned over and put her face up beside her child and they looked together out the window. There was no announcement over the speaker system congratulating the woman and uh, I all those like this at all. It was such a little thing. And yet interiorly, she was already flying first class. Interiorly, she was already arriving home of her birth even before she got to her mother's house. She realized that she and her child both deserved better than close enough. And her own awakening heart wouldn't settle for it. And that's a quickening like that. We're trying to calibrate our heart to an ever finer scale where we pick up on things like that. The tone in the voice, the sideways glance, the little innuendo, the subtlety of it. Like a lot of therapies like this too. A lot of the intimacy of it. And it isn't just intimacy with another person. It isn't interpersonal intimacy, but it's intrapersonal intimacy with your own heart, with your own pain, your own sorrow, your own wonder and so on, to become habituated in the subtlety of things, how delicate it is like this. I want to give another example of awakening <coughs> of this way, the, the, the deep healing of the depth dimension of our life. It's always there. Um, I want to give an example in the midst of nature that you're walking along and it's, the sun is setting. And uh, you don't think much of it. I mean, it sets every night. But th th this particular night seems particularly beautiful. And uh, so you sit down 
and you give yourself over to the beauty of the setting sun giving itself over to you. It's one of those, we've all had moments like this, I think, just like that. And I like to, it's good for us to become students of this moment. It could be any moment. This could be lovers in their oneness with each other, the mother with the child. It could be a person alone, patiently enduring a terminal illness. It could be visiting and sitting at the deathbed of a dying mother or father. It could be the quietness of people in an art museum, quietly moving from peace to peace to peace. It could be whatever happens as it happens, it comes as it comes like this. And I, I want to uh, use the example of a sunset as the example. <clears throat> so you're sitting, we're going to become students of this moment. First of all, to notice, first the observation is that it's a moment of heightened awareness. That is, it's not lethargic or dull. Just the opposite is more vivid, like your awareness is heightened. And it's heightened in a state of being more, uh, a heightened state of, of your own presence, present to and one with the presence of the setting sun. Like this, like communion. There's like a communion. And notice that in this, com this intimately realized communal oneness, notice that you're not thinking. Or put it another way, if you are thinking, whatever you are thinking pales in richness to this communal awareness that grazes your heart and blesses you at, the, at this moment. And therefore, this moment of awareness, there's witness that thinking doesn't have the final say in what understanding is. See, for us in ego consciousness, to understand is to comprehend. Thomas Merton once said, in the spiritual order, to understand is to accept that you're infinitely understood, is to understand. And in this heightened state of awareness, the thinking you and all that it thinks is transcended. In the it's not negated. It's not abolished. On the contrary, it's a gift. We're thinking right now. But thinking doesn't have the final say in what awareness is to, 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 be, to be awakened. To be awakened. I, mean, I want to use uh, this so, this so thought is transcended. Next, notice you don't know what this, you don't know. It isn't just that you know that it's called a setting sun because you saw one before and uh, your mother or your father told you that's called a sunset. It's not an act of memory. It isn't memory where you know what it is because you saw it before and you know, you know the name for it. Because notice the setting sun right now, is, it's virginal. It's, it's, it's not in time. It's like a timeless moment, Richard Rohr called deep time, the pleroma. The deep time in the mist. This is why when you sit like this in moments with art or silence or poetry, and you're in a state of absorption, you have to look at the watch because you don't know how much time has passed. It's transcending time in, in the midst of time. It's virginal. And there's this realization that throughout all the eons of the past, up to this moment, the sun is never, never, never set before tonight, ever. And in all the eons left to come, It'll never, never, never set again. It's a once and for all, all time event, the welling up of the boundaryless immediacy, <clears throat> intimately realized. And the remembering you and all that it remembers is transcended. Merton says, it is that in us that belongs completely to God. And it is not subject to the violence of our own will. No matter what, you, no matter what anyone did to you in the past, and no matter what anyone did to you, did to you, that's a drama, that's a dilemma of the trauma survivor. It isn't that what was done to me, but it's what was done to me, did to me. It's left me like this, like this. And so, uh, uh, and, and since we tend to treat ourselves the way we were treated, uh, there is that in you that belongs completely to God and all the violence you inflict upon your, sometimes we catch ourselves in the act of perpetuating violence on the part of us that needs to be loved the most. The part that's the most afraid, is most confused, is most uncertain. To be infinitely tender-hearted toward the hurting place. See, to join God who's infinitely tender-hearted toward the hurting place in you. And so it's, it's beyond memory. It's, 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 it's the eternality of the fleetingness of life, intimately realized. And thirdly, you're beyond desire. You're beyond desire. 
because the richness of the moment is not a richness that by your own desire you can make happen. The proof of it is you can be so touched by this, you might go down the next site, embrace yourself to have another moment with the setting sun and nothing happens. You can't make it happen. You can't make it happen. And uh, the moment uh, passes. And uh, you linger for a while about the scene as it sets, it starts to get darker and darker like this. And uh, Robert Frost has a poem. The, the, he, he says, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not mind me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and I have promises to keep. He goes on. The person would say, this a mystically awakened person. Something was given to me here, and I want to keep coming back here a lot and walk in these woods. And so Thomas Merton was said, how can I claim these, how can I claim the years, how can I, although I walk in these woods, how can I claim to love them? One by one, I shall forget the name of individual things. John of the Cross talks about in the beginning, the beauty of nature is seductive because of possessiveness of heart. But as you're awakened, he says, as you walk in the mountains, you know that the, he said the beloved has passed this way in haste. And you go even deeper. Then he says, the mystical, my beloved is the mountains. The body, the world is God's body and that is bodying forth the love that's uttering it into being like this. This is the divinity, the concreteness, the rerum natura, the things of intimately realized. And you sit like this. So this is not an ecstasy. This is an ecstasy don't happen. It is. It might, but it tends not to. It tends not to. So what we're learning to do is to calibrate our heart to a fine enough scale. This is what meditation is: fine enough scale that we can begin to pick up this divinity that's always is happening right now. As a matter of fact, giving this talk and listening to this talk is is this kind of we're, we're we're in a meditative state together. Notice the talk has no content in a way. But in a way, it's kind of evoking or an invitation to uh, the thing about moments like this, the way I experience it is uh, most things that we notice in life, we notice in passing on our way to something else. We glance at it. But every so often, something catches your eye and you kind of pause. And as you pause, which is kind of to contemplate, if you, as you linger there in the wordless pause, you can feel yourself undergoing a kind of a descent that you're dropping down into a qualitatively deeper place within yourself in union with previously unrecognized qualitatively deeper places of the oneness with that with which you're contemplating. Us sitting here, us being together like this, the sunset, the darkness of the night, your own breath, whatever it is, the flower, the bird, it comes as it comes. It is granted to whom it granted like this. And uh, so the sun is setting, you get in the car and you uh, stop home, get some groceries, you pull in your driveway and uh, you go into your kitchen, you get your mail, you're standing in the kitchen sorting out the mail and the bills. And as you stand in your own kitchen, you remember the moment of the setting sun. And you ask, here's the secret's question. Why do I spend so many of my waking hours trapped on the outer circumference of the inner richness of the life that I'm living? Why is the centrifugal force? This God's oneness with me is always there. John, I say, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. It's always with me, closer to me than I am to myself. But in the centrifugal force of life's complexities, I spin out and away from this all-encompassing oneness like this. How can I learn to abide in the depths so fleetingly glimpse? And that's the seeker's question. You know, in a monastery, everything is carefully crafted to protect this. Out here in the world, it's not like this at all. And uh, out here in the world, you have to make a decision within your heart not to get co-opted by, by the passing complexities of things and hold fast to what your heart knows is true by the three foundations for contemplative living. One is to find your practice and practice it. 
in a broad sense, the, a practice is any act faithfully entered into with your whole heart that takes you to the deeper place. So it might be the long, slow walk to no place in particular. It, it might be tending the roses. It might be being vulnerable in the presence of that person in whose presence you're taken to the deeper place. It might be being present to the child. It might be accepting the fact that maybe you're going to be more alone than ever thought you'd be asked to be and tasting the intimacy of solitude within yourself like this. It might be giving yourself over as a form of giving to the community. Or here's another way that I put it. Find that act, find that person, find that community, which when you give yourself over to it with your whole heart, it unravels your petty preoccupation with your self-absorbed self and strangely brings you home to yourself near your origin. It's like in one level, it exhausts you. Another level, it unexplainedly enriches you. You feel so grateful. Thomas Merton once said, we should all get down on our knees right now and thank God we can't live the way we want to. He says, you cannot love and live on your own terms. So you live by the imperative of your awakened heart. We, we cannot make these awakenings happen, but we can choose to assume the stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken by what we cannot attain, and that's meditation practice. It's the daily rendezvous that has no agenda but love. Like, here I am, Lord, just as I am, like an unlearned child. Like this. Merton says, when we begin to pray, we always begin by reminding ourselves that we belong completely to God, who's, who, who's permeating us and taking us to herself, to himself, unexplainably forever, like this. And we sit that we might get regrounded in that. And regrounded in that, we end the daily rendezvous by asking for the grace not to break the thread of the oneness that's always there. Driving, driving to work, going down a hallway, opening a door, and it, as if out of the corner of your eye, as if months and weeks and years go by, it's a more of an underlying habitual, like little tastes or flashpoints of the sustaining oneness that protects us from nothing, even as we are unexplainably sustained in all things on up to our moment of death and beyond it's like that i think so that's the practice Edo roshi who's then master said if you're faithful to your practice your practice will be faithful to you and you carry it with you in your heart and eventually all life becomes practice it's an habitual underlying uh sensitivity like this. You know, sometimes I think, too, we can get the feeling that we're in the presence of someone who's more present to us than we are. And they can see in us a value we can't yet see. And we kind of have a faith in what they see in us, the beloved, the friend, the one who's there. So little by little, it might arc over into us so we might find our way back to our own life again. And maybe by living this way, you become someone where you can be like that to somebody else, unexpectedly. Grandmother, grandfather, son or daughter, friend, neighbor, whatever, the life. Next, one pillar then is to find your practice and practice it till all life becomes practice. Next is to find your teaching and follow it. And the teaching is any teaching that bears witness to this. See, See so every, everything Jesus says is like this. If you read it contemplatively, Everything Jesus said is like falling off a cliff. It's like a free fall into a bottomless abyss because it's the abyss-like word of God speaking itself in the world. And we sit like an unlearned child and open the scriptures. And when Jesus says, fear not, I'm with you always, we know that the deathless presence of Jesus is speaking to our own heart, that God is with us always not to be afraid, and so on. So one, this, this is the mystics. This is the, the voice of poets. This is that voice that just rings with the unexplainable. See, it gives resonance to it. The logos, like this. Which is also the words of lovers, the words of poets. It's the one who cries out in pain. And it's the one who offers the words of solace and reassurance. See, this, this living word that we learn to live by. And then secondly, if they offer guidance in it. If you really sit with it, they first they awaken it. Because you can tell, when we read the mystics, I think, you can tell they're talking about what your heart's been quickened by. Maybe not with the intensity of which they speak, but it shimmers and shines. Like I know this somehow. And not only do their words bear witness to it, 
but then they offer guidance. What is the path along which we might abide in it? And this is the teaching. And eventually you realize that all life is your teacher. If you let it every given moment, we're being taught. So there's no, there's no lack of spiritual guidance. There's only a lack of the guidance being given and we habituate it. And thirdly is community. The community is God. You and God forever and ever and ever and ever. Because you're the beloved. You're the beloved. And also the community is just one other person in whose presence you know you're not alone on this path. Maybe you live with the person, lucky you. One of the gifts I think of all you folks, and I'm here with you in cyberspace, we're all together. I think one of the, 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 the gifts like this is being with each other, being with each other because we recognize each other. One Zen master once said, it's very hard to keep a log burning in a fireplace all alone. Put four or five logs together. So when we're together like this, all of each of us gains the communal presence of the group and the whole group is gaining by your presence here. And this is contemplative community like this. And maybe, the, maybe this presence, this person has been dead for years. But their deathless presence is with you always. Gabriel Marcel, his mother died when he was very young. And he was a philosopher and a, a musician, a composer. He was a playwright. And he said about his dead mother, he said, it's amazing how present a dead person can be. Sometimes someone who's died past through the veil of death is more alive to you than someone who's sitting right next to you in the room like this. Where you read St. John of the Cross, you open up the love poetry, John of the Cross, been dead for centuries, and yet his deathless presence shines everything he said because he spoke from such a pure place in his heart like this. And, uh, and so this is your community. And then the whole world is your community. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And we walk this earth of infinitely loved broken people. And we're one of them. And we walk this walk that we might be 11 in the dough and their life might be a little better because we're here to do this like this. And uh, so this is our, this is our practice. All life is practice. This is our teaching. Life itself is teaching us. We're being taught right now. And in community, the whole world is our community. At least claim to our heart, at least claim to our heart. Uh, this world, this world, and we're, and we're part of that world, like this. So, uh, I'd like to end with a few stories that, that people told me in therapy and on retreats and different things. One is uh, on the delicacy of this. There was a woman I was seeing in therapy, and uh, her, neither of her parents physically, emotionally, or sexually abused her but they were constantly screaming at each other in a very violent way. And as a little, as a little girl, she would just get terrified, but they're, they were so aware of their rage for each other, they couldn't see what they were doing to her. And she felt strangely invisible to them. And she was in therapy. And uh, she uh, said one night, she would, she would, we're talking about memories. She says, one summer night, her mother and father were screaming at each other. And she went to the back patio door and slid the patio door open and went out into the dark in the backyard. And there was a tree growing there in the backyard. And she climbed up in the low branches of the tree. She could hear her parents inside yelling at each other. And she says, she sat in the branches of the tree. She closed one eye and lined up a twig with a star. And she said to God, if you know I'm here, Make the star move to the other side of that twig. And she waited and waited and waited. And she said, uh, she said, God didn't move the twig, move the star. And then she said, without knowing she was going to say it, she said, but there's something about the remembrance of myself sitting alone in the dark, waiting for God to move a star that consoles me. Like this, moves me. And I said to her, you know, uh, it's true God didn't move the star. But it's also true, years later, in sharing the story, you were moved. And I want to tell you something. Thank you for telling me that story, because I was moved. And let's make a deal here in therapy. Anytime you and I feel stuck in the healing work, 
we'll imagine we're sitting together in the low branches of that tree, leaning into it together, staying open together to guide us together along the path. I would suggest that's the depth intimacy level of uh, healing, of the healing work. I've seen another image. I think this is the last chapter of the book, the story. Next to us. Anyway, here, here's the story. This woman, uh, I, some of these retreat houses I would go to over and over over the years. Uh, every other year I'd go back. And this is one of those retreat houses where I, I'd been there many times. And uh, uh, there's maybe 100 people on the retreat, I don't know. And there was a woman there on the retreat. I saw her there before in years past. She, she never came up to approach me to talk. And uh, this one occasion, she came up and asked if we could speak alone for a while. I said, yes. <clears throat> so into this room that they gave me to see people and sat down and she told me this story. She said, when my husband and I fell in love and got married, we had our first child. And uh, our, our first child was, um, uh, uh, it was sincerely on the on the spectrum, uh, dissociative spectrum of uh, what was the name's escaping right now? It was what is it? Um, anyway, with serious mental deficiencies in the child. Having I, mean, I can't think of anything. Anyway, the child was on the spectrum, and uh, she's we were devastated by it. We were both just devastated by it, and. She said it took a bigger and bigger toll on their marriage. It took a bigger toll on them. It took a bigger toll on her. And um, as, as a few years later, it, the, the crisis kept deepening. And um, she found out that there's a psychiatrist in the town where she lived who works with parents who have children with these psychiatric issues, child, child uh, symptomatology and so on. And so she took her little boy, he was five, I think at the time. She took her boy to the first session with a psychiatrist. She made the appointment, he said, he said, be sure to bring your son with you. And when she pulled into the parking lot at the psychiatrist's office, uh, she saw that her son had wet his pants. And so she is going down the hallway, crying, holding her son's hand with his wet pants and brings the um, son with her into the room and the psychiatrist talks to her and talks to the son and then takes the son out to one of the nurses there to help him and so on. And he helped uh, get her son into work with people who work with children with these issues and behavioral cognitive strategies and I mean, all of that. And then the psychiatrist said to her, well, how about you? How about you? You know, might be a good idea that you get some help. And she agreed, so she went to see him every week uh, for a year, processing all of this. And about the end of the year, she came in to see him, and she said, you know, she said, I think I'm done. She said, I, I'm in a much better place. He said, I agree. He said, I think you are in a much better place. And he said, in that case, he said, I have a gift to give you, if you tell me what it is. And spontaneously, she said, her face lit up, and she said, my son. And he said, that's right. That's exactly right. He was a Buddhist. He said, now I must pay homage. And he got up out of his chair, knelt down on his knees, and he bowed over and touched the floor to the floor, and he bowed down to her. And she was so moved when she told me that she got up out of her chair because she sensed, in being in the silence of the retreat, she was sensing this experience, being on the retreat. And she got down and bowed down to me on the floor. And I was moved by seeing her there. I got up, like, get up, please sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. And uh, she told me that um, driving home from that session with the psychiatrist, she said, uh, everything became luminous. The street was lit up, the trees were lit up. Everything became fluorescent. She had no previous background in art at all. And uh, she went to an art store, got big pieces of watercolor paper and watercolors and tried to paint what she saw when she accepted the gift of her son. And she had brought with her a framed paint. I should have brought it in with me and hangs out here. And she gave me one of the first paintings she ever did, uh, painted like that, like the gift. And uh, I 
kept that painting in my psychotherapy office over my shoulder so people seeing me in therapy could see the I never told them what it was but I sensed poetically that the light shining out from that gift would gift their healing presence with me in the room and then when my wife got Alzheimer's and I had to stay with her all the time and close down the practice, it, it hangs here in the living room and I still think of it. And I have, I have a, something to tell, it's something so important. Don't you think it's true that there are certain moments where a person like unexpectedly broke open in front of you and shared something so heartfelt like this? that it still blesses you every time you remember it like this. And is it not also true in moments, I know you have to be discreet about this and we just can't walk around, you can't. But sometimes, that's why I say when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone who will not invade us or abandon us, we can learn not to invade or abandon ourselves. This is true. We can be reparented in love. But deeper down, when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone who will not invade us or abandon us, we can discover what Jesus called the pearl of great price, the invincible preciousness of ourself and our brokenness, and we can taste it for ourselves. And sometimes it's a gift to sit with someone when this happens to them. Sometimes they start crying. Sometimes they just sit still. They don't know what to say. And... Uh, uh, there's just these priceless moments that are moments which is really the true nature of, 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 of every moment of our life, really. And so what is this, what is this deep healing then of spirituality? It's, it's the healing of this depth dimension that we learn to drop deeper and deeper in childlike sincerity down to this bottomless abyss of love that's welling up and giving itself away in and as this moment that we're sitting here. It's always, it's, like, it's always like right here. And, uh, and then once we're free, once more and more freed up we are from that abyss-like centering, we might be tempted to say, I'm out of here. I'm a mystic in the making, and uh, I, I'm, I'm heading out to mystical realms. But that would betray everything because it radicalizes our commitment to the world. And we circle back around to be present to the hurting world in a more Christ-like and grounded way. And it starts within yourself. And so you ground yourself. I'll speak about trauma, for example. And the adult you with God's grace draws close to the hurting place to touch it with love. And when you draw close to touch it with love, in the touch, some of that hurt flows back through your finger into you. And you start to get flooded. And so you help someone help you to learn how to back away. You back away, not to keep running in the other direction, to, to get regrounded in love again, only to keep returning back to touching the hurting place with love. And then you go back and you get regrounded again to touch the hurting place in love. And as you do that over and over and over again, that's love's work. You're doing love's work to yourself, walking to the pain and touching it with love so that it might dissolve in love and only love is left. It's like learning to die of love at the hands of love until only love is love. And the love shimmers and shines in the unresolved places in your heart and in the world. And you hand it over to God and walk your walk with gratitude and with amazement. And uh, uh, th so this is, this is my sense of this day here together, this morning together. Because at some level, all of you already knew this. And all of you are on this path where you wouldn't have been moved to come here. And so the morning together is like, a, is like uh, re-energizing the intimacy of this deep heart knowledge that we can't explain to anybody, including ourselves. But we renew our effort to, li to live in it day by day and to learn to live by it and share it with others day by day is given to us to do so. So let's do a sit, five minutes.
So uh, we have uh, to a quarter after for dialogue. Do you want to stand? You want to stand up for just a second if you want to, just if you care to, just stand for just a second. Okay, be seated. Uh, any questions? Any concerns? Anything not clear? However, uh, feel free to approach the microphone. And we'll have a concluding dialogue. Many, a uh, few years ago, you uh, opened a moment for me that I had, but uh, it was closed. And, and you may remember I shared that uh, when my mother was, was, was being taken to the hospital, And as uh, the wheelchair is going out the front door, she just waves her fingers to my father, who was sitting in an easy chair. And she said, bye, Oscar. And then she left. And she passed away a few days later. They had been together for almost 70 years. And, and I lived through that moment, but when I shared it at the retreat, it opened up. So I just have one word, and it's in Spanish, but it's a loaded word. The word is gracias. Uh. Thanks for sharing that. I remember that very well. It was years ago. Father Tom Stella told me you might be here. I'll never forget that moment. And I'll tell you how it struck me, how you said it. Uh, as your mother was being carried down the stairs, and she turns like this, and like, by Oscar. That moment is an eternal moment. And her hand is still raised there like that like the eternality of love. And although he never saw her again, I remember you also shared with me, worrying about, they were so close, after one died, how would the other get by like this? And now they both crossed over. It's so mysterious. And here's the amazing thing, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my daughter, my, I, my, Maureen's gone. But I realized I'm 80 years old, I'm not stuck here. You know, it isn't like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm on my way out. And my daughters, will they, will they cry? When I, they'll probably cry, I guess. But not, not all tears are, tears are regretful, see, crossing over. And, uh, and then guess what? Uh, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, they're next. Well, here's how I put it. When we're born onto the earthly plane, God exhales himself, God exhales himself and our passage through time from birth to death. And we're here for a very short time, really, and basically just to learn how to love. Basically. And in God's good time, God exhales, and we come back full circle into God. And uh, the whole purpose is this love. And so there are certain moments that are, that moment is so precious like this. And then when we share a moment like that from our heart, it blesses everyone in the room who hears it, because this is what matters most that we can learn to breathe this and walk this and live by it and trust it. So thank you for sharing that, seriously. God, yes, yes. So this is not a question. I just want to say thank you. I'm deeply grateful to you. You've carried me through some very deep stress and trauma. You were that string. You showed me the string attached to God, and I hung to it. And I'm just, you're so beautiful. And I'm deeply grateful. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you very much. Bless us, me. thank you. I'm so touched by these stories, and I'm so touched by all of you. You know, I mean, the communal sincerity, it moves me. Uh, years ago, when I first started giving a retreat, uh, there was a man on the retreat, he was an elderly gentleman, who always, the age that I am now, but 40 years ago, he was elderly. <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, he wore a three-piece suit and tie. He was very formal. And he took the side on so strict he wouldn't even talk to me. 
he handed me a handwritten note. I still keep it. It's in my Bible right here. And in the note, he says, uh, he said, I went to my spiritual director and I told him I was having a hard time living my spiritual life. My director said, we'll meditate 15 minutes a day. He said, I, I told him I was head of a large corporation. I didn't have 15 minutes a day. He said, that's perfect. Take 30 minutes. And he said, that was 30 years ago. He told me that. And this handwritten note, he said, 30 years, question mark, 30 minutes, question mark. And then he said, Deo gracias. Like this. You know, just the, the, the blessedness of it all. And, uh, well, yeah, mercy, yeah. Good afternoon. Hi, Jim. My Hi, name hi. is Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. The first time, I want to say just two quick things. The first time um, I heard you was on a retreat with the Francisco Renewal Center over in California, and you said, when you think you're praying, you're not. It's when you don't think you're praying that you are. And that's, that stuck with me. But what I want to share is just the, the final journey of my husband when he was dying. And it's in a book that I wrote. Uh, but um, when, when we took him to a hospice center, I looked up in the corner, and my best friend was with me, and I said, the third one, there's someone there. And we couldn't quite think. And she said, I know, I can feel a presence. And my husband was in the bed, right? And I said, oh, I know who it is. It's the baby I miscarried. He's there. And I said to him, Michael, baby Michael, you cannot have your daddy yet. We need him. Jim went through two, two and a half days of, um, of his dying process at that point. Uh, the morning he died, I had slept with him the night before at the, in the hospice in the bed. And sung, sang, I sang to him and talked to him, and I think he finally decided I could get the hell out of here because that singing is driving me crazy. But anyway, about 7.30 in the morning, I said, because Jim wouldn't leave. And, I, and he, was, he was in a coma, obviously. And so I said, okay, baby Michael, it's time. Come get your daddy. Fifteen minutes later, Jim exhaled his last breath. He died, of course, with his mouth wide open, being in a coma. I was talking with the doctor, and I turned back to the bed. I could not close his mouth. You, know, you can't do that when they die, right? His mouth was closed, and he was smiling. I know there's an afterlife. Yeah. He shows up. He still shows up. In March, he shows up. He's been here. People tell me, you're hallucinating. I don't see him, but I feel him. And this is yeah, his yeah, birthday yeah. month. So yeah. I'm not sure what, if there's a question in that, but no. Well, thanks for sharing. Am I crazy? No, it's, it's, no, 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 it's a gift. It's, 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 a, it's great. You know, another, another insight that consoles me about this is, uh, in terms of memory, the healing of memory is to not what we can remember or not remember, but to know that we'll never be forgotten, and we'll always be in God, remembered in God. Forever. And I'll put it another way, that if God knows we're here right now sharing like this. And because God doesn't forget, when we die and cross over into God, we'll all go into our being together right now forever. That everything real is forever. Someone once said, you don't understand human nature until you understand why a child on a merry-go-round will wave at its parents every time around, That's and they right. always wave back. Death and resurrection, death and resurrection. It, things only seem to go away, but down in our heart, we know that nothing real ever goes away. Yeah. It's the eternality of everything. Thank so you. thank you for sharing that. I'll, let me share with you a story, too, that I was touched by. It's in the book, The VA Hospital. I was uh, on a rotation men with terminal illness with uh, pulmonary chronic lung disease in the final stages. So there were four beds in the room, one in each corner, and they all had their oxygen mask on. And, as they were going through this. My job as an intern was to go in and check with them about depression, how to chart the encounter was like that, and I would talk to them. And when I went in, one of the beds was empty because someone had just died, which was the only way to get an opening onto the unit. And the new guy that came on was a divorced, chain-smoking, alcoholic businessman. 
and he had arrangements for a business phone to be put by his bed, and he would take deep things with his mouth and talk to his stockbroker trading stock. He was uncooperative with the with the medic with the regimen treatment regimen. He told the other three men dying of the same disease he was. He didn't want to have anything to do with them, like this. When I came, to, I introduced myself. I said, "I'm going to be coming in to see you." He said, "I don't want to see you." I said, "You have no choice. I got to see you, so you got to see me. How about this? We'll keep it brief." And so we shook on it. I, I would honor that. I went, "How are you doing?" I walked away, and I went in one morning, and he opened his pajama top. He said, look at this uh, muscle spasm on my chest right here. And I went in the morning after he got the biopsy. It was a very aggressive cancer coming out through his chest wall. And uh, when I approached the bed, he reached out and he took my hand and he held my hand. And he said, I wasn't born a son of a bitch. He said, I became one. He said, I think I'm ready to give it up. I said, you're going to retire as a son of a bitch? He said, I am. And he did. He was cooperative with the nursing. He talked to the other three men. You know that cart they put meals on? They tied a string to it so they could get things. But I talked to his adult son out in the hallway with tears in his eyes. He said, it's the first time my father's ever talked to me, ever. And I went in to see the other three men the day after he died. And we all talked about what a good man he was and how grateful we were for the chance to get to know him. Sometime in the 11th hour, you can save your life and take other people along with you. And uh, we must never underestimate the greatest impact we're having on other people when we're sincerely vulnerable and real with each other and this deathless love that's ribbon to our whole lives to so learn to live by it. So it's a, it's a gift, you know. We have six minutes left. Let's do a brief sit to end. How would that be? Let's do a five minute sit. How's that sound? Go in together in communal silence like this. Jim, um, <clears throat> to say thank you to you is, seems empty. You um, shared your vulnerability with us today. And uh, it was hard for me to listen to you. And I would uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm assuming it was hard for you, too. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, it's, it's strange, but I feel kind of euphoric. I feel energized after spending three hours with you uh, and talking about a topic that's heavy. And I would also say that uh, I had the... Uh, the pleasure of uh, talking with Jim a number of times as we planned this uh, retreat this morning. And every time I concluded my conversation with you, I felt energized. So I, uh, I thank you for, for being with us. And we are, uh, we're honored that you would share your experiences with us. I don't know if, um, if we should give you a round of applause or it almost seems inappropriate, but I think you might like it. So, <laughs> and you probably will say, oh, is that all? Why not clap a little longer? So, yes. 
Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. We do much. appreciate I, I, it. Yeah, I felt such a, a affinity with your community when I was there. That's why I so gladly accepted the invitation when I was there in person. Just the, just the faith community there is really real and uh, it's, it's, it's a gifted community. So thank I, you. I was so Our glad pleasure. you could do this. And thanks for inviting me. Yes. Our pleasure. Thanks for accepting. Yeah. Okay, you're dismissed. <laughs>